Let's go through the three question warm up for Farm Basics 8. First question, in what disorder is there an abnormal breakdown of elastin? That's alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Remember, this causes emphysema. If you see emphysema in an older smoker or ex-smoker, that's probably COPD due to smoking. But if you see emphysema in a young person or a non-smoker, think about alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, and it can also cause liver disease and rarely skin problems. Next, what are the symptoms of normal pressure hydrocephalus? Normal pressure hydrocephalus causes a reversible form of dementia where you have expansion of the ventricles. Most of the time, dementia is irreversible, but this is one you can actually treat and make better. The mnemonic for the symptoms is wacky, wet, and wobbly. A patient would have dementia, urinary incontinence, and ataxia. Next, a patient with a cortical lesion and left arm paralysis is unaware of his neurologic deficiency. Where is the lesion? This is hemispatial neglect, where the patient is basically unaware of one side of his body or one side of the surrounding space. These patients do not know that they have this problem. It is a lesion to the non-dominant parietal lobe, which is classically the right parietal lobe. That's it for our warm-up. Now I'm going to hand it over to Dr. McInnes for the lecture. Hi, I'm Dr. Mike McInnes, and in this video, we're going to be talking about pharmacodynamics. Pharmacodynamics has to do with the relationship between drug concentration and drug effect. Let's start with efficacy and potency. We're going to look at some graphs that are similar to the michaelis menten graphs in a lot of ways, but instead of talking about the action of an enzyme on a substrate, now we're talking about the action of a drug to produce some therapeutic effect. Efficacy is the maximal response or maximal effect that a drug can produce. We have the dose plotted on the x-axis, but here we've plotted it on a logarithmic scale rather than a linear scale, and that's going to give the curve an S-shape. Then on the y-axis, we have the percentage maximal response, that maximal effect that the drug can produce. And this is kind of similar to Vmax. So think about a blood pressure drug. If you give a little dose, you might lower the blood pressure a little bit, like two points. If you give a big dose, you might lower the blood pressure a lot, maybe 20 points. And at some point, there's a limit to how much you can possibly lower the blood pressure with that drug. Even if you give more and more and more drug, there's a limit to how much the blood pressure is actually going to drop. So that limit is the maximal effect. And that maximal effect is basically the efficacy. So say drug B is a second blood pressure drug, and it looks like this. Maybe drug A is able to lower the blood pressure 20 points, but drug B is only able to lower the blood pressure, say, 14 points. So we would say the efficacy of drug A is higher than the efficacy of drug B. It has nothing to do with dose. Then potency is the amount of drug needed to achieve a given effect. So efficacy has nothing to do with the dose given, but potency is all about the dose you're giving. I'm not going to go into detail about how exactly we calculate potency, but think back to our example of blood pressure drugs. It looks like we get to the maximal effect at about 1 on this scale. Let's say that's 1 milligram just as an example. Now, drug C has the same maximal effect, so what can we say about the efficacy? So both of these drugs are capable of achieving the same maximal effect. They both lower blood pressure by 20 points or whatever. So they have the same efficacy. They're both equally efficacious. But for this drug C, you have to give a much larger dose to achieve that same maximal effect. It looks like you have to give something like 100 milligrams to lower the blood pressure 20 points. So drug A is much more potent than drug C. Drug A has a higher potency. So how does adding an antagonist affect potency and efficacy? This is another four or five star topic. Be sure you know how to interpret these graphs. So here in red, we see a receptor agonist. And then you add a competitive antagonist to the system. So what does that do? Well, you're shifting the curve to the right. With the antagonist, it takes a higher dose to achieve the same response, so you're increasing Km. And does that change efficacy or potency? Well, if you're increasing Km, then you're decreasing potency, right? Now, in this graph, you have the agonist in red, and in orange, you've added a non-competitive antagonist. We also said that could be called an irreversible antagonist. And that non-competitive antagonist is decreasing your Vmax. So has Km changed? No, the Km for both of these is around 2, so you're not changing the Km. The potency hasn't changed, but you're decreasing Vmax, so you're changing efficacy. You're decreasing the efficacy here. Now, in this graph, we're not looking at either a competitive or a non-competitive antagonist. We're looking at something called a partial agonist. A partial agonist is a substance that kind of works like a full agonist, but not quite. So how does a partial agonist compare to a full agonist? Well, with a partial agonist, you're decreasing Vmax, which decreases the efficacy. But you can also see that you're shifting the curve to the left with this particular one. So in this case, you're decreasing Km, which is increasing the potency. So a partial agonist is always going to decrease Vmax, and it's going to change the efficacy in one direction or the other. Here, the green curve is the full agonist, 
and then the orange and pink curves are two different partial agonists. In each of these partial agonists, Vmax is lower, so efficacy is lower. But with a partial agonist A, you're lowering KM and increasing potency. And with partial agonist B, you have a higher KM, which means a decreased potency. So potency is an independent variable, but partial agonists always decrease efficacy. Now let's talk about drug safety and therapy. Uh, excuse me, what's going on here? Who are you? Well, I'm Dr. Mike McKinnis. I'm one of the chief educators here at Doctors of Training. Whoa, and I'm whoa, talking whoa, about whoa, whoa, whoa there, Kermit. I'm Mike McKinnis. Well, I'm the one giving the lecture. Are you serious? I was like five minutes late. Listen, beat it, bub. I'll take it from here. All right, the last topic is therapeutic index, which deals with drug safety. There are two components of therapeutic index, LD50 and ED50. LD50 is the dose of drug that's lethal to 50% of people. LD is lethal dose, so it's the dose that's lethal to 50% of the population. And ED50 is the dose that's effective for 50% of the population. So if you divide LD50 by ED50, that gives you the therapeutic index. And you can either have a high therapeutic index or a low therapeutic index. Now, which is better? Well, safer drugs have a higher therapeutic index. So a high therapeutic index means the drug is safer. Let's think about that mathematically. Look at the numerator. If LD50 is higher, that means it takes a higher dose of the medication to kill the patient. And that makes it safer, right? Then consider the denominator. If ED50 is small, that means that a very, very small dose of the drug is going to be effective, and that's going to increase your therapeutic index also. So a high therapeutic index is good. You can have a high therapeutic index either when the lethal dose is very, very high or when the effective dose is very, very low. So what are some drugs that have a low therapeutic index? That means that a toxic dose is only a tiny bit higher than the effective dose. Well, these tend to be drugs that we have to monitor on a regular basis, such as seizure drugs, lithium, digoxin, and warfarin. So these are all going to be drugs that have a low therapeutic index. Then there's also the concept of the therapeutic window, which just means the range of doses of the drug that are safe. So if a drug has a wide therapeutic window, that means there's a big gap between the effective dose and the toxic dose, and that's good. A narrow therapeutic window means that that gap is pretty small, and it's easy to go from a nice, safe therapeutic dose to a toxic dose, so that's pretty straightforward, too. So let's go ahead and work through the end of session quiz. First question. An investigator has developed two new preparations of insulin. It takes 16 units of insulin preparation A to lower the blood glucose by 50 milligrams per deciliter. It takes 12 units of preparation B to lower the blood glucose by 50. So which insulin preparation has the higher efficacy? Efficacy can't be determined from the information given since efficacy has to do with the maximal response a drug can produce. It's possible that if you gave a higher dose of either insulin preparation, the glucose would fall even more. Likewise, we can't say that potency is higher or lower in either drug since potency is also related to the maximal response. The data given suggests that preparation B may be more potent than preparation A since it takes less of B to produce the equivalent result, but we can't say that for sure. So be sure you understand these terms because they may give you choices like drug A has higher efficacy and drug B has higher efficacy, and the correct choice might be none of the above. Next, what effect will a competitive antagonist have on Vmax and KM? So a competitive antagonist will reduce the drug's potency, so KM will be higher, but Vmax will be unchanged. Next, your patient is taking experimental drug Z to lower his LDL cholesterol. When he's given the antagonist drug X, the potency of drug Z is decreased, but efficacy is unchanged. Doubling the dose of drug Z is shown to overcome the inhibition by drug X. Does drug X inhibit drug Z competitively or non-competitively? So if you can overcome an antagonist by adding more of the agonist, which is drug Z in this case, then drug X must be a competitive antagonist. And remember, competitive antagonists will reduce potency, but they won't change efficacy. Now, last question. Drug A has a therapeutic index of 10 to 1, while drug B has a therapeutic index of 2 to 1. So which drug would be considered safer? Well, there are a couple of different ways you can approach this. You can remember that therapeutic index is LD50 over ED50. So if drug A has a lethal dose of, say, 10 grams, but drug B has a lethal dose of just 2 grams, and the effective dose is the same for both, in this case it's one gram, then drug A is much safer. Or you can just remember that a high therapeutic index means the drug is safer. So 10 to 1 is a lot higher than 2 to 1, so again, drug A is safer. All right, that's it for now. I'll see you next time.